we will pray and then um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're up to right now. Let's pray. God, we lift up this morning to you and just ask for your um, work to be happening in our hearts and in our lives, God. I pray that you would use this time and you would equip us and prepare us for lifetimes of faithfulness, God, that we would uh, be able to look back and reflect on the lessons that we've learned at the Leadership Initiative and that we would uh, feel better prepared to um, engage with the world that you made and help other people come to know you. So God, we pray for this morning and um, just grateful for these students that are here. We pray for the ones that maybe are traveling here slowly because of the ice and just ask that you would keep them safe. Um, God, we just want to give you this time right now and ask that you would help us to utilize it well in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are in... Uh, the Leadership Initiative is... The, the hope that I've always had for this ministry is to train and equip you guys for... Um, being good ministers of the gospel. We've talked about that being your identity, that you are priests, that you are ambassadors. And my hope is that uh, the time that we spend together on Sunday mornings grows you in your abilities, your skills and abilities to interact with people at school or at work or, or wherever you guys might encounter uh, those scenarios. We're in a section currently on apologetics. And apologetics like apologetics comes from the word, um, it's a Greek word, but it, but it means like giving a reasoned defense, uh, kind of giving the, the reasons or the motivation behind um, what you believe. And the text that teaches that concept is 1 Peter 3.15, where Peter is telling us to always be prepared to give an answer or the reason for the hope that we have. And so as Christians, that is what God is calling us to do. Be prepared to give the reasoning, the motivation behind the hope that you have in, in Christ. So uh, we've spent multiple weeks now doing that together. This is week five of apologetics. Um, so we've kind of covered a lot of ground. We've got a, we've got a little bit more to go in apologetics before we start talking about sharing our faith or evangelism. Um, so today we're going to talk about We'll actually talk about some of the pointers to faith. And, and uh, next week we'll talk about some different gateways. And what we're doing is we're identifying things in the world that, that we can use to, to open up conversations about faith or to help people um, see that there is a God of the universe who loves them and wants to be in relationship to them. Uh, but let's start out by doing <clears throat> some review. Uh, last week we talked about the importance of the audience, uh, the importance of the audience, and um, the idea here is if you're going to be good at apologetics, you have to be able to identify what's going on with, with people. And so we need to be very aware of who it is that we're talking to and what it is that motivates and drives them. So if we were to look at the Bible and we were to kind of look for examples of people doing apologetics in this way, just being very aware of the audience, the book of Acts gives us multiple examples of that. And so uh, there are three listed on your outline, and, and I think that there are lots more within the book of Acts, but, but these three big categories help us to understand um, being familiar with the audience. So number one, apologetics to the Jews. And we see that in Acts 2 where Peter is addressing uh, the group of people who are in Jerusalem because of the Pentecost, the Feast of the Harvest. There's people from, I mean the Bible describes it in Acts 2 that there are people from all over uh, the, the region around the Middle East. So people are coming from near and far and they're gathering in Jerusalem uh, and, and they're there because of the Jewish feast of Pentecost, the, the Jewish festival, and the Holy Spirit falls on the disciples and they begin to speak in different languages and people are hearing them in all these different languages and the people are beginning to ask questions. What's going on with these guys? Are they drunk? Or, you know, how are they talking in languages that that they haven't even learned before. And Peter 
uh, gets up and he reasons with them. He does apologetics. He says, these men are not drunk as you suppose. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. Let me explain to you what is going on here. And he begins to uh, reason with them um, from the scriptures. He tells them in the book of Joel, or Joel or Amos, I can't recall right now, but he's saying the fulfillment of that prophecy is happening in your sight. God promised that he would pour his spirit out on the people, and that is exactly what you are seeing today. And he begins to explain to them some of these different realities. And, and he goes on and he presents the, the Christian message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen. And he says, you know, we did that. We, Jewish people, we murdered the Messiah. And the response was, brothers, what do we do? And he tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Uh, for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of Jesus. And you will receive this gift, the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and for those who are far off, for your children. Um, so, uh, what Peter is doing there is he is identifying the people group that he's talking to and he's speaking to them using their language. What, what are some of the... Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll do this first one for you guys and then I'll ask you to help me with these other two examples. But with what Peter was doing was he was using familiar language... Okay? He was using a language that the people, the crowd, would understand. He was talking to them using their terms. Uh, he was able to use the scriptures. That was a common bond that he had with them. That they, all of these Jewish believers uh, that, that are coming from all of these different places, they all believed in the scriptures. So he was able to use that to try to reason with them. So he was identifying the audience and recognizing they have this Jewish expectation or hope. And so I can use that to try to point them to the fulfillment of that hope in Christ Jesus. Um, now, I was thinking as I was preparing this stuff of what some of the contemporary applications would be. Okay, Because I want, I want you guys to think this way. Okay, cool idea. What does that look like for me? What does that look like for you guys? And the two, um, I guess, contemporary groups that I would say this has immediate application for, one would be any of your Jewish friends. You know, I don't know how many, I don't know the demographics of your schools or anything like that, but if you come into contact with somebody with that Jewish heritage, that, that um, Jewish cultural upbringing, you're going to be able to use scriptures, the Old Testament, and you're going to be able to use kind of that expectation that they have of a Messiah, just like Peter did. Okay? So if you know of any um, Jewish people, then you can use this method just like Peter did. Um, I guess one, one example would be there was a, a young man at Outdoor Outreach who, he, he's, a, he's a Jewish, um, you know, his parents are Jewish. He, he's a practicing um, Jew and, and he is uh, there were a lot of like stipulations that his parents were like we want him to be at camp because he has so much fun but the whole Jesus thing like we're a little bit hesitant about that we'd appreciate it if he could you know not have to sit in and listen to you guys talk about Jesus and you know we had to tell them that's not really an option I mean that's really what the camp is all about and there's so many times that people are talking about Jesus, that it would be impossible to try to keep him separated from everyone. So there's an example right there. When I was doing the teaching for the middle school students, I was very aware that I had to use the scriptures and try to reveal the, the reality that all of their expectations and all of their hopes and all that the scriptures proclaim has been fulfilled in Christ. And so I can use the Bible, the Old Testament, and, and hopefully help this young man come to faith in Christ. You, you guys, uh, that's what I'm hoping, could do the same thing. You guys could, with any uh, Jewish people, you could also recognize who they are, what's important to them, and, and then look for um, entry ways to speak to them about Christ. Another, I guess, contemporary application for that first one is, I would say, nominal Christians, meaning people who associate with the culture of Christianity, but it's questionable whether or not they actually believe. Um, 
So I, I'm sure you guys could think of, of some people who f maybe fit that category. They might go to church, they might talk about Christianity, but if you examine their lives, there's, there's not fruit or evidence that there's an authentic faith there. And I think that, the, that some of these ideas could also apply in that scenario. That, that scriptures would resonate with them. That you could talk to them about the Bible, you could talk to them about Christian expectations, and, and really you would have an obligation to take it a step further and try to help them to believe in Christ. Does that make sense to you guys? The second group um, that we can talk about from the book of Acts is apologetics to the Greeks. Uh, and we see that in Acts 17 where Paul is speaking to uh, the, the group in, in Areopagus. He goes in to um, their marketplace, to Mars Hill, and he begins to interact with these people who are um, Greeks, Greek-thinking people. Um, what he does with them is he identifies like things that are important to them and he, he uses that kind of as an on-ramp to speak to them about God. So if you can recall in Acts 17, um, Paul kind of, it looks like he's examining the culture, he's kind of studying it, and then he goes in and he begins to speak to them and he says, you know, men of Athens, I see that you're religious in lots of different ways, that you have all these different altars to different gods. You, you guys are very spiritual people. I even saw an altar to an unknown god. So he's identifying things in their culture that are, that are valuable and important to them, but he's using that as an opportunity to present the real gospel, the, the faith in Christ aspect. And so he says, I'm here today to proclaim to you this unknown God. And he begins to talk about God and he uses um, their poetry, he quotes their poetry, um, he uses nature as a, as a tool to help people understand what he's talking about. But, but what he's doing, and this is the whole point of, of what we talked about last week, He's identifying the audience and he's relating to them. He's noticing what's important to them, what carries weight for them, and he's using that to try to present the Christian message. And that's what I'm challenging you guys to do as well. That good apologetics requires you to study uh, and examine the people to which you want to speak and be able to relate to them and, and identify with them. And then number three... Uh, apologetics to the Romans um, and that that is dealing with Paul's legal speeches where he's brought before a trial uh, he's brought before kings or governors and he has to give his uh, defense of why are you here what, what are the accusations against you what do you have to say for yourself and what he did in that scenario was different than what he did in Acts 17. He didn't just quote poetry. He didn't just point to things in culture. He used the language of the courtroom. And he reasoned with the kings and governors that he got brought before. And he did it in a way uh, that makes Christianity look intelligible. You know, he, he used their language, their system... And he used that in order to try to point them to Christ. So, we'll, I think as we do um, some of these different pointers to faith, we can come back to these three and maybe identify which pointers Paul was using in, in which cases, or Peter was using in Acts 2. Um, but here are the principles. Okay, those were the examples. Here are some of the different principles. If you want to be good at apologetics, Number one, you need a cultural awareness leading to individual awareness. Okay, let me explain what I mean. On the, on the one hand, you need to be thinking about culture. And you need to be identifying in culture what is important to people. What do people value? What, what, um, what would carry weight in a conversation? Okay, so you need to be culturally aware. And uh, some of the things that we talked about last week were studying culture. That as you, even as you watch TV or you read magazines or you just observe people, what you're doing is you're thinking as a Christian 
uh, what is going on here? What, what is going on in this culture um, that is important to people? And, and you need to be a student of that. Um, so we say things like this. You shouldn't just study the Bible. You should study people. And you should be able to harmonize that and bring those two things together. Um, so that would be cultural awareness. But it needs to lead to individual awareness. It's not enough to just know, oh, I think that teenagers are kind of like this. That's, a, that's good, but it's not, it's not going to be helpful when you have a teenager sitting in front of you. You have to know what is going on with this individual. Okay? I need some individual awareness. There are some generalities that we could say about people in our culture, but then you're going to need to be very specific when you're dealing with somebody that you know. And, and you need to be aware of what is going on with this person and how can I meet them where they're at. Um, so that's going to take some awareness. Number two, we need adaptability. Uh, or another way to say it is we need to be able to change where it's appropriate. Okay, adaptability. What this is, is a, it is a willingness to meet people where they are. Okay, you can't expect for some of your friends to come to youth group. They, they, they might be so far removed from any idea of Christianity that that just wouldn't work. They're going to be so uncomfortable, uh, you know, they might have reasons for why they don't want anything to do with a church or with Christians. And adaptability is the willingness to go hang out with them, meet them where they're at, um, speak their language. Um, you know, it's, it's flexibility. And I, I think that the New Testament really puts that forward as a, a very important piece of the missionary heart of God. That if you're going to be successful in helping people, you've got to be willing to meet them where they are. A really good example of this was the missionary Hudson Taylor. And he was one of the first missionaries to China. And I think he was the one who was responsible for this huge organization called China Inland Mission. But when he went there, he was, he was very much a white boy. And very much a, a white boy who was raised in our culture of Christianity. So he goes to China and he's wearing like this suit and, you know, he's all studious and he's trying to present the gospel. But he has no, he has no, he has no cultural change with him, you know. Like he, does, he doesn't have any, uh, he's not able to relate to them. So he, he recognized that God calls us to adaptability. He calls us to meet people where they're at. And so he actually grew out this really long like ponytail. And like you know how in their culture back then they would have like a shaved head and a little patch of hair with a ponytail. And he would wear like their clothing and he would, he would act like them. And when he began to do that, when he made that conscious shift in his ministry style, all of a sudden... He had an audience. He had people who would listen to what he had to say. Now that, that principle is what we're talking about here. Adaptability. You need to be able to identify what is going on with the people in your life. And how can you meet them where they are. Now if you treat them as if the things that are important to, to them are icky to you. Because you're, you're a Christian. Then that's going to shut down the conversation very quickly. Uh, so you need to be able to identify with them and, and, uh, and be adaptable in that way. Uh, recognize that this is an act of love. This is exactly what God did for you. As he sent his son Jesus, Jesus became adaptable to us in our humanity. Right? He took on flesh. He lived in our, in our world. He, he, he suffered. He worked. He did all the stuff that we do. Yet he was without sin. That's what God is calling us to do. You need to be able to incarnate the love of Christ. You need to be able to step into the world of the people that you're trying to reach and do it with love and humility. Number three, we need sensibility. Sensibility. And what I mean here is you need to be able to think about what's going to be most appropriate. Okay? Um, 
you need to try to recognize what is going to be the most effective way to reach the people that you love. Um, so one example, and this is from Tim Keller, he talks about A doctrines and B doctrines, and he says, A doctrines are ones that people will readily accept. It's something that, that um, resonates with cult their culture. And if you present that truth, people are going to give you an amen, even if they're not believers. Amen, that sounds good. B doctrines are, are a doctrine of Christianity that's going to be a point of conflict. And he says, if you're going to teach people the, the whole counsel of God, he, he gives this illustration, you should float B doctrines on A do doctrines into people's lives. Okay? You've got an A doctrine that is uh, acceptable to this culture. Uh, it's going to flow into the stream of their lives. Uh, a B doctrine is, it's a sinker. You know, it's not going to, you're going to say it and people are going to go, huh? No way, that's wrong. You've got to float the B doctrine on the A doctrine into people's lives. Now, here's what, here's what this illustration means. You should be able to identify what's important to, to the people that you're speaking to, realizing what's going to be, what's going to carry weight with them, what's going to sound good to them, and then you also have to carry along these other truths of the gospel along with that. But you wouldn't lead with a negative truth. Okay? You wouldn't lead with a B doctrine. Okay? Uh, and I gave you the example last week of, of um, sexuality in our culture. Okay? The biblical definition of sexuality in our culture is a B doctrine. It is one that people hear it and they go, no, no, no. That's all wrong. That's so old-fashioned. Okay, we live in 2013. That's a B doctrine. So if you're going to try to reach a person, don't lead with a B doctrine. Don't, don't have your first step into their life be, let me tell you how the, how the Bible talks about uh, sexuality. Because that's just going to be abrasive to people. What you should do is lead with something that's going to resonate with them, recognizing that you also have this responsibility to, to bring along some of these other truths and, and recognize that over the long haul of a relationship, you can begin to love people and, and explain some of these other things. So the point is, is that you need to lead with what the culture will perceive to be positive and, and, then, and then also bring along those other elements. Does that make sense? The, the last uh, principle as far as apologetics that we talked about last week was the importance of um, fidelity. And basically what I mean by that is um, there are things that we cannot flex or change on. Okay? There, are, there are truths of the gospel that we can't, we can't throw out. There, there are principles of the Christian message that we cannot adapt for people. Um, the need for God's grace. You, you cannot adapt that. You know, you can't just go, oh, that's, a, you know, that's an important you know, Christian principle, but why don't you just try really hard to be a good person? No, you can't. There's certain truths you can't flex on. And so we need to, we need to recognize what those things are, and then we need to be faithful um, to them. So we want to be careful not to neglect the truth of the gospel. Um, I think, was it Trisha or Tiffany last week that talked about universalism? Um, that, that's a great example. The universalism is something that is incompatible with the gospel. It doesn't fit with the gospel. Universalism says all people are in. God is loving, he's kind, he's gracious. He's probably made a way for anybody to have a, a relationship with him. And, they, you know, people might say things like, you know, I think that all religions kind of lead to God one way or another. Well, that just doesn't fit with the truth of the gospel. Jesus made some exclusive claims. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we can't, we can't, um, we can't flex on that truth. You know, we can't go, oh, you're, you know, you believe differently? Uh, it's no big deal. You know, you'll probably still get in because all roads lead to God. That just, that doesn't fit. And so we need to have fidelity uh, at points of the gospel where we can't flex. Hopefully this, this is making sense for you guys. Um, so the big ideas from last week are uh, we need to recognize the importance of the audience 
And then we need to um, begin to put into play some of these different principles. Go ahead, Tricia. Um, would you consider the Trinity to be one of those? It's a good question. I feel like we, we talked a little bit about this before. I think that you, you asked this question a long time ago, too. Um, the Trinity. Let me think. I, I guess somebody could have... I don't know. That's, pr that's a pretty essential truth because it's getting at the nature of who God is. Um, so, on the one hand, I would say it is, it is a non-negotiable. You know, you can't say... Uh, which, I'm in a course right now on church history and a lot of like the debates and errors in the early church had to do with the Trinity trying to figure out how does Jesus and God and the Spirit relate to one another? Are they different? Was Jesus created? Was he not really fully God and fully man? Was he like mainly God and just kind of like an illusion of man? Um, and all these different questions that they wrestled through and they came to the conclusion of the things that we would believe. That God is three in one. That Jesus is both fully God and fully man. And, and all those different realities. And they rejected any teaching that was contrary to that. And so I would say that the Trinity is an, is an essential truth of Christianity. Now, when it comes to an individual, and they might have some wrong beliefs regarding um, the Trinity. Like they might think Jesus is just the Son of God. He's not really God. Um, I, I guess... I would, I would be a l little bit lenient there because if they, maybe they're, they're just ignorant and they don't know yet and so God is kind of working on them and wants to reveal the fullness of uh, the, the Trinity and if they have genuine faith that God is going to work you know, on their behalf through Christ, maybe they don't totally understand it, I'm a little bit lenient there. But I think that um, genuine faith is going to lead people into truth and so they're going to begin to see the realities of the Trinity I think maybe I should just stick with it's an essential um, so people need to believe that any other questions at this point do you guys see how this stuff works so far the importance of apologetics and noticing who, who it is that you're talking to Okay, let's, uh, let's move into this next section, um, the reasonableness of faith. And the idea here, we'll just spend a couple minutes on it, but the idea here is that Christianity is, it's, you're not just being called to blind faith. It, it actually makes sense. And that's something that, that is important for people who have hang-ups with Christianity. We need to be able to show them how these things fit together. Um, so C.S. Lewis says it this way, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And he is using that word picture to say that is what Christianity is like. It is like the sun that I can see and I can just be in awe of its radiance and its beauty. But I can also see how it informs me of everything else that I encounter. But the idea really is we need a Christian worldview. We need to be able to see in our world the way that the God of the universe has made it. And we need to, we, we need to be able to interpret everything that we ever experience under that under that heading. So, letter A, a Christian worldview is the real view of the world. A Christian worldview is the real view of the world. That's what we're saying here. Is that if we understand God and we understand the world that He made and we understand some of the implications of the fall and redemption and some of the effects that that has had on humanity and creation. If we understand those big pieces, we are viewing the world through the lens of reality. Now, we're going to get pieces of that wrong. 
We don't see everything clearly. We see dimly currently. Uh, we can't see perfectly, but, but we are beginning to kind of get into focus reality when we view the world through a Christian lens. So that's what we, we are um, trying to do is we're trying to recognize how, how everything in the world actually fits in a Christian worldview. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, one of the uh, early church fathers, he, he actually wrote, a, he wrote like a huge encyclopedia of how all of the knowledge in the world at his time fit into a Christian worldview. I was interested, like I heard about that this week as I was doing my homework and I was like, really? I wonder what that would look like, just like books and books and books. But what he did there, I think, is, is what we should be able to do. Not, not write a book with all the information in the world. But we should be able to see that everything that we in, encounter fits into the Christian worldview. That everything in the world uh, is, is under the banner of God made it and, um, and all the realities of the Christian worldview. So, letter B, how can we show the rationality of the Christian faith? This is from McGrath's book. He says, number one, by showing there is a good, argumentative, or evidential. Argumentative or evidential base for the core beliefs of Christianity. Sorry for the big words. I'm not good at spelling, so if I was in your shoes, I'd be like... Just scribble stuff. But <clears throat> we can show the rationality of the Christian faith by showing that there is good... Um, basically, you could just put evidence. You could put evidence there uh, for the core beliefs of Christianity. So, he's saying on, in these two different ways, we can prove rationally that Christianity is the best option and we can prove evidentially, meaning, you know, from evidence in the world, that Christianity makes sense. Number two, we can show the rationality of the Christian faith by showing that if the Christian faith is true, it makes more sense of reality than its alternatives. We are presenting the very best option. Do you guys believe that? That you have, you have as a believer, with the scriptures... You have the best um, view of reality out of anything out there. So, um, if you are rightly understanding the scriptures, and you're rightly understanding the world, then what you could present is better than a non-believing scientist could present. Christianity is, is um, it makes more sense than, than its alternatives. Um, now, I think that it would be hard for us without like this huge amount of schooling and background and, and study to be able to do that, but, but nonetheless, it's still true. Christianity presents a more realistic picture of the world than any alternative can. Um, so, if you were to compare, let's just use one example, like evolution, because I know that that's heavily taught in public schools. Christianity presents a, a better case than evolution does. The case for creation is more compelling than the case for the Big Bang Theory and evolution. Okay? If you just, you know, you had all of the evidence there, the evidence is going to be heavier on the side of creation because that presents a more realistic picture of reality. Now, people spend a lot of time and energy trying to say, no, 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 this is, this is the better, more real deal. But what we're saying is Christianity actually is um, better than its alternatives. So why does this matter? Why does the reasonableness of Christianity matter? Here's why. It is very difficult to defend the Christian faith publicly if it's seen to be irrational. You know, when your friends come to you and they've got these hang-ups of why they're not Christians and the challenges that they have with believing Christianity, if you don't, have, if you don't treat their concerns um, with seriousness and you just kind of write them off in a dismissive manner without 
without showing Christianity to be better uh, than, than maybe some of the other conclusions they're coming to, then it's going to be very hard for them to believe in Christianity. Now, I'm not saying you have that responsibility to, to prove Christianity in every case, but you should know that Christianity is not irrational, that it does have a good explanation, and that there are people who could explain and answer hard questions. And so that's, that's I guess, what I'm encouraging you guys to, to know and to consider. That there are good Christian thinkers who can answer very hard, challenging questions in a way that is very rational and very sane. So, um, let's do pointers to faith. Um, we've, we've said now that there is a reasonableness to faith, that faith makes sense, because God made the world, and if you kind of follow the evidence, the trail leads to God himself. Um, but now let's go ahead and let's identify some of those different pointers, some of those different trails that would lead us to God. Here are some quotes from McGrath's book. He says, When it comes to theories of life or worldviews, the evidence available to us just isn't good enough to prove that any of them, including atheism, are right. In the end... We have to make these decisions as matters of faith. Okay, So, in the end, Christianity, atheism, and all these other things, uh, as reasonable as arguments are, at some point we, we are making a faith claim. Okay, So, Christians, we, we weigh the evidence, we look at the world, and we look at all of the, all of the realities in the world, and we make this faith claim that the God of the universe made it that it is tarred and marred because of sin, and God has made a way for us to be brought back to beauty and brought back into harmony with Him. But that's a faith claim. We've got a lot of evidence to prove that, and, I, and we believe it absolutely to be true, but it is a faith claim. Now, the same is true with atheism or any other religion. They're taking all of the evidence and then they're looking at it and they're, they're making assumptions and then they come to a, a claim at the end where they would say something like, well, I just don't believe that there is a God. So I'm looking at all the evidence and I'm coming to this conclusion um, that there is no God. So what, what McGrath is pointing out is we've got the best evidence and we've got the best conclusion, but in the end we have to make these decisions as a matter of faith. Uh, what we should be doing is we should be pointing people to some of these truths and realities so that way they have good evidence to hopefully arrive at, at the conclusion that Christianity is legitimate. So, we are not being asked to take things on blind trust. There are realities in the world. There, are, there, there is sufficient evidence to lead us to belief in God and faith in Christ. And these are uh, like McGrath would say, clues. So a clue or a pointer is something that suggests but does not prove. Clues have cumulative significance pointing to a deeper pattern, pattern of meaning that gives each of them their true meaning. So we're looking at the world and we're looking at some of these different clues or evidence or pointers that could lead somebody to, to arrive at, there's a God and I need to be in relation to him. So let's go ahead and do some of these. Clue number one, creation. The origins of the universe. Now, I didn't have time to put together the info from the book, but essentially what, what McGrath says is that scientific evidence is now leaning more heavily towards creation than towards something like evolution or the Big Bang. That the leading researchers and scientists are coming to the conclusion that there is an intelligent designer. So if you're just exploring the world and trying to make sense of it, where did it come from? The evidence points to there is a creative designer standing behind this who originated the whole deal. Okay, it didn't just come from nothing. There had to be something that that uh, made this the way that it is. So that is a big clue. Um, now what I want to do is I'll, as we go through these, let's ask the question, and I'm, I'm asking you guys to contribute here, um, with the different examples from the book of Acts. P 
Peter in Acts 2, Paul in Acts 17, and Paul in Acts chapters 22 through 26. Who used these different pointers and how did they use them? Now, I don't know if every one of these is going to work, but let's, let's see if we can come up with some ideas. Who used the clue of creation to help uh, the, the audience that he was speaking to? There might be more than one. And you might need to pull out a Bible so you can kind of look it over again. <clears throat> go ahead and go to Acts. And just look at these different accounts. Acts 2, Acts 17, and Acts chapters 22 through 26. Any, any ideas? Who, who utilized clue number one of creation? And use that as evidence to try to help people come to that conclusion that there's a God. I'll turn there with you. Any ideas? Okay, keep, keep looking because I'm going to continue to ask, but I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one. You guys can get the rest. Paul uses it in Acts 17. If you guys are there, it says in verse 24, after he identifies this altar to an unknown God, and he says, what you worship is something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. And then he, he uses the pointer of creation, the clue of creation, to try to lead them to an authentic understanding of the real God of the universe. He says in verse 24, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. So Paul uses that pointer, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the one who we can't build a house for. Okay? He's not served by us. He made us. And we are dependent upon him for life and breath and everything else. Okay, So he uses that clue there. And then he goes on uh, to to continue to try to remove any obstacles to their faith. All right, clue number two, um, fine-tuning, a universe designed for life. <clears throat> clue number two is fine-tuning, a universe designed for life. Many recent scientific studies have emphasized the significance of certain fundamental cosmological constants the values of which, if varied even slightly, would have significant implications for the emergence of human existence. That, that's a complex sentence, but what it's saying is the world was designed very specifically for us to, to be able to live on it. Now, if anything were to change even just slightly, that would be an impossibility. So you look at the evidence for how the world is made and the fine-tuning that it has built into it for us to be able to live and exist, that, that is, I would say, a clue to the fact that God made it that way. That it was such a narrow margin. You know, if we were just a little bit closer to the sun, we'd burn up. If we were just a few feet further away, we'd freeze to death. We are fine-tuned to be in the, the scenario that we're in. That's not, I would say, that's not consequential. That's not just like, oh, yeah, bonus. We, we were on a planet that was just right. Now, it makes more sense to say God fine-tuned fine the universe so that way we could have our existence. Um, can you think of any of the examples from Acts that maybe use that clue? There's going to be some overlap. Megan? Is it in 22? 22 of Acts 17? Oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 22. Yeah. Let's see. Verse 14. Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, in a sense, I would say, you're right, Megan. Uh, chapter 22, verse 14, says, Then he said, right? That's where you're at? Yeah. 
Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. Um, I, I get um, what you're getting at there, Megan, because the, the truth is God is fine-tuning the world so specifically that there could be life. He's also fine-tuning it in, in his providence. And so you can say things like, he placed you in the slice of history that you're in, uh, in, in order that you would come to know him. And so, you know, he, he put you here, and Paul is saying to this group here, he has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth talking about Christ. Um, and then he continues to say, you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard and now what you are waiting for. Get up, be baptized, wash away your sin, calling on his name. He's saying, you know, you have been placed here uh, in order to hear Christ and respond to him. God is, is so actively involved in his creation that he even placed you in the slice of history that you're in uh, so that you would respond to Christ. Okay? Um, anyone else want to want to see if you can find an example of somebody using clue number two of fine tuning? Similar to that, I would say in Acts 17, um, this is a comp I, I would say a parallel truth. In verse 26 of Acts 17, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. So God, it's in God that he has fine-tuned the world in order that we can even live and move and have our being. He has, he has so made his creation in a way that we can exist. And then he has been active in his creation, placing us in different points of history in order that we would reach out to him and, and perhaps find him and call on him. And, and, and I think that that's a, a great example, Megan, of... Um, just pointing out that fine-tuning uh, clue. Let's do number three. Clue number three is order. The structure of the physical world. <clears throat> order. The structure of the physical world. One of the most significant parallels between the natural sciences and Christian theology is a fundamental conviction that the world is characterized characterized by regularity and intelligibility. Both creation in general and human reasoning in particular bear traces or imprints of the creative ordering of God. Essentially what this is talking about is God designed the world in order to work. That it, it has order, it has structure. You know, some of the implications of, of something like... Um, well, I don't know if this is going to be true, but I'll just say it. I'm, I'm ignorant, so I'm not sure if it's true. But something like um, evolution, there has to be some sort of, there's randomness to it, right? Isn't that a part of the teaching? Is that there's kind of this random, like random things happen, and, and then based off of enough random things happening, then the right thing occurs. Am I, ta am I talking about the right concept? evolution or something like that. But um, there's a randomness. Christianity is saying, no, it's highly ordered. That God ordered things. That there's, there's a structure to the world that he made that makes sense. And, and if it's not just random and happenstance, but it's very intentional, then that is a clue that leads us to this God who is acting intentionally in our lives. Do you see any, um, any parallels in the different acts examples of this. Not sure if I can think of any, but maybe as a team we can come up with any. Do you see any examples where order is kind of being pointed to as a clue that there is a God?
kind of, I don't know if it's, if it's right or not, but like um, in 22 where he says, um, Paul saying, men of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. He's kind of pointing out like their order. And, I don't know if that's what you know by order. But uh, yeah, no, <laughs> that's. They're like, piousness, piousness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, yeah, he's pointing out um, he's pointing out that they are a spiritual people, and he's and I think you know I think that that might play into one of these a little bit further down. I th I think, um, but yeah, I, I would say that they are a spiritual per people, and they are searching for this God who who made them. And so they are, you know, looking, they're looking, they're exploring all these different options with all these different religions. And they're looking for the God of reality. And, and Paul's going to explain that to them. Um, I would also say order, um, as far as, like, Paul, in chapters 22 through 24, he's giving a very orderly account, right? He's using... Uh, the legal terminology and so he's presenting a very reasoned case and so that kind of uh, parallels that truth there that Paul is um, kind of systematically presenting the truths of the gospel to these different judges that he's having to stand before so I think that that points out just kind of the the reasonableness of Christianity he's, he's showing them using a very ordered apologetic there all right, let's do number four. Clue number four is morality, a longing for justice. Morality. <clears throat> um, basically, all of us are, are built with this inner sense of right and wrong. And the truth is, if there is no God standing behind his creation, determining what right and wrong is, we could do whatever we wanted. You know? It, it wouldn't ultimately matter. If, you know, I think that these are some of the implications of not believing in God. You know, you, you, should, just, you should just live it up. You know, do whatever you want. Do whatever is going to bring you pleasure and satisfaction. Uh, but, morality, I think, is a big clue that points us to God. That there is right and wrong, that there are consequences to our actions, and um, and there is one who authored morality. Um, I think that that's that's an important truth. Um, so morality is a clue, a longing for justice, and uh, I was thinking of an example to share with you guys. But um, a clue like this... Oh, go ahead, Tricia. Um, I thought in verse 22, um, and then it's, it's talking about Saul and how he was like on the road, and he was Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what you remind me where? What chapter? It's in 22. Chapter twenty-two. Yeah, kind of that. He's retelling. Paul is retelling his conversion story of where he encounters Jesus on the road uh, to Damascus, and he is. Jesus says to him, "You're not just persecuting people. You're persecuting me." And so his whole concept of right and wrong is being challenged by Christ himself. And what Paul considers to be right is actually wrong. And so he needs this God outside of himself to, to correct him. Like you're, you're killing people thinking you're doing the right thing. When in fact, you're doing the very opposite of right. You're killing people that are my chosen people, my church. Um, so he, he's pointing out his 
lack of morality there and like you said he was blinded and that would be kind of a humiliating experience there a humbling experience that would make him more aware of God and more aware of you know God's call on his life so clue number four is morality a longing for justice and I think that this is this is important when we're when we're thinking about particular people that we want to help um, morality is going to is probably going to be a clue that's going to be helpful. I mean, all of these are potentially helpful, but the example that I that I thought of was somebody who's been abused or mistreated. They have a they have a huge longing for justice, right? They want to see justice brought into the world, and particularly if they've been abused, they want to see justice executed for them and, and maybe with the, the person who hurt them. And so that is a clue, an on-ramp that we can use to show them that there is a God of justice. That things that happen to you are not just written off. They're not just excused by God, but He is in fact storing up wrath for the day of, of judgment where He will settle all accounts and He will perfectly execute justice. And so that is a that clue could be very helpful for somebody who um, has been abused. Now to go back to something we talked about earlier, for that person that's an A doctrine, right? If I've been abused, the the doctrine of justice is going to be very appealing to me. That God is going to make things right. Um, a B doctrine in that case would be grace that's been abused, if you just tell them that there is a God of grace who deals, you know, gracefully with people, that might be a B doctrine to somebody who's been abused. You mean God could forgive the person who did that to me? That's going to be offensive to them. That's going to be a B doctrine. Now, it's true. It's equally as true as, as justice, but, but we need to be aware of those different realities. Again, that goes back to knowing your audience and knowing what's going to be important to them. So clue number four could be used in that way uh, with somebody who's been abused. Number five is desire. We're going to have to pick up the pace here. Um, clue number five, desire, uh, a homing inst instinct for God. Um, we were made to know God. And so every single person you could say is kind of restless as they are searching for that. Um, St. Augustine puts it this way, you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Now that clue um, is true of all peoples. And so we can use that one to say the reason why you go from thing to thing to thing in pursuit of joy and happiness and you're and it's elusive to you is because those things weren't made to be an end in and of themselves. You were made for God. So you can try to get all the awards in your, in your particular sport that you're doing. You can try to achieve all sorts of success academically or professionally. You can do all of that. You could, you could make it to the NFL or the NBA and you could find yourself very, very empty because you were made for God. And until you settle that and get that thing right, everything else in the world is going to be hollow because you were made for God. So that's a clue that we have a desire, that every single person has this desire for God because God has made us and we belong to Him and, and we're kind of wandering now as we're awaiting a return to Him. So that is another clue that we can use. Number six is beauty. Clue number six is beauty, the splendor of the natural world. Nature is meant to disclose the beauty of God, functioning as a school of desire in which humanity may learn how to perceive God's glory and respond in faith and awe. Nature shows off God. And we know that from passages like Romans 1, 18-20 where God's invisible qualities, His divine nature, have been clearly revealed in His creation uh, so that men are without excuse. Or Psalm 19, where it says that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim... Uh, I don't remember exactly, but you guys know what I'm talking about. The, the world that God made reveals God's glory. Nature is a clue. The beauty of nature is a clue 
to the reality of a beautiful God. And so, uh, you know, you, you bring somebody on a hike and they get to see the mountain range. Um, that is a clue. That's a pointer. You have friends who enjoy the lake and they like to go out on the lake and they just look at it and it just strikes awe in people's heart. Or music, you know, you go to a concert with people and music, I mean, not just like nature, but even like what, what we can make, the beauty in the world from humanity. That's a pointer to God, you know. So you go to this concert and it, music does something to people. It moves them. And you experience that with a friend that is a pointer to God, who is the creator of all beauty. Clue number seven, relationality. God as a person. Um, we were made to be in relationship, not isolation. So we all have this kind of desire to be in community. It's not good for man to be alone. Um, we, we were all made to relate to other people and especially to God. And so that's a clue. Now, obviously, personality types and everything are going to give you, you know, differences and how much is needed. But all of us, I would say, have that longing for relationship and friendship and intimacy. And that is all pointing us to the greater reality that we were made by a relational God who wants to relate to us. We were made by a God who is in himself perfect community three persons in one joyfully uh, experiencing each other's company for all of eternity and out of that abundance and out of out of that relational um, surplus he makes us and we were made to be in relationship with God and with others when Jesus was questioned what's the greatest commandment love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself and that's the reality there. That's the clue. That is, you were made to relate to God and to other people. And so as you identify, you know, you, you know, maybe you can look at somebody at your school who is wandering from relationship to relationship, looking for, you know, intimacy and companionship and, and friendship. And they're, they're trying to fill that need with stupid boys, okay? Or... or stupid girls and it's not working but that's a clue you know why you really 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 want this is because God made you to long for a relationship and you know what you really need is not a transient relationship that could end in a day or not work out you need one with some permanence and God offers that to you that's a clue that we can utilize um, to lead people to faith in God number seven I'm sorry, number eight. Clue number eight, eternity. Eternity, the intuition of hope. Uh, McGrath says, The memory of the Garden of Eden seems imprinted on our souls, rising to challenge and refresh us when we lose sight of our true identity and goal. Uh, Ecclesiastes talks about God has put eternity, he, he has set eternity in the hearts of all men. Uh, he has made us and designed us with this reality that my 80 or 100 years or 35 years on this earth are just, you know, a, a, a preclude. You know, they, they just come before. It's just the, it's the pregame to the real deal. And I'm going to live for forever. And I have that imprinted on my soul. So I know that eternity is a reality intuitively and all people kind of have that have that in them God made them that way like what happens after you die that is a that is a very penetrating question you don't just return to the earth and then go into like this this sleep where you're unconscious people know intuitively that they're they're gonna last for forever and so that is a clue to help us lead people to faith in God. That we are meant to relate to God and we're going to live for forever. And He has made provision for us to do that. So those are, those are several clues that point us to a loving God. Um, do you guys have any questions about this stuff? Any comments? 
these uh, really are meant to kind of be tools in your tool chest. You know, that as we kind of stack these different clues together, um, hopefully you'll be able to recall them when the situation arises, when you're talking to somebody. Uh, you can think back on what are, what are some of the different things that God um, has given us in creation that leads us to belief in Him, and, and we've done eight of them. Uh, so hopefully they kind of get imprinted on you so that way you can recall them easily. But that's the, that's the point. Is we, I want to give you some different tools to help you be able to do these uh, apologetic conversations with people. Next week we'll do gateways. And I think what that's getting at is, um, is identifying very specific things in people's lives where, where we would have an on-ramp to talk to them about faith. But let's pray. And we'll call it a morning. God, thank you so much for the time that we've had together this morning. And uh, God, if there are things that were unclear or unhelpful, I pray that your spirit would bring clarity and understanding. Pray, God, that if there are things that I talked about that, that just aren't true, that you would just help us to be very forgetful this morning. And, uh, but the things that are true, God, that you want us to know and that you want us to use for your glory, I pray that you would... Help those things to be very prominent in our minds. And as we think about our friends and uh, the people who have reasons why they don't believe in Christianity, God, help us to be instruments that you can use to remove obstacles to faith. Help us to be very gracious in our dealings with people and, and help us to be very wise and understanding as we try to know what's going on with those specific people. And we try to know how your truths are helpful to them, God. So give us wisdom and give us ability beyond ourselves to be able to help people come to faith in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.